Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today, uh, both here on Capitol Hill as well as online. Uh, we're really excited to have you be part of this conversation where we're going to reflect on the May 10th agreement that was signed in 2007 um, and reflect on how it can impact the conversations that we're having related to the NAFTA 2.0 deficiencies. Our conversation today will sp focus specifically on the agreement's unbalanced pharmaceutical provisions. Uh, because as America is debating the high cost of drugs and the impact that those drugs have on patients, on our economy, and on the healthcare system, it is not, now is not the time to enshrine into law extended monopoly rights for branded pharmaceutical companies. So our panel today, uh, Tim, Laura, and Tom, will be discussing this issue in detail. We also will be joined uh, by Chairman Blumenauer from the, the Subcommittee on Trade. He's actually in a vote at the moment, but will be joining us as soon as he can to make some, you know, some remarks to us today as well. Before we begin, though, let me quickly introduce our panel. Uh, speaking first will be Tim Keeler. Tim is a partner at, for, in the international trade practice at Mayor Brown, where he specializes in international trade and investment and policy. Prior to joining the firm, he worked as chief of staff to USTR, uh, was a senior official at the Treasury Department, as well as being an uh, international trade specialist at the Senate Finance Committee. Tim also is an adjunct professor at Georgetown University and serves as a director on the, Internet, the Washington International Trade Association's board. Second speaking will be Laura peralta Schult, who is a government relations advocate at the Network Lobby for Catholic um, serve, social justice. In this capacity, she represents the network on issues of trade, taxation, immigration in front of the administration and Congress. Prior to joining Network, uh, Laura worked at uh, Warner Lambert in the, as a in, director for international government affairs, uh, was a high school teacher, as well as worked at the Democratic National Committee. Uh, our final speaker will be Tom Boyke. Uh, Tom is director of the Global Health Program and a senior fellow for global health development and economics at the, Cent the Council for Foreign Relations. He is an, also an adjunct professor at Georgetown University. Um, and prior to joining CFR, he was a fellow at the Center for Global Development, a director at the office of USTR. He was, uh, he, he was a Fulbright scholar in South Africa, uh, as well as a law clerk for Chief Judge Edward Corman and a health policy expert at HHS. Just last week, Tom Code authored a study that was um, outside on the table with the New England Journal of Medicine where he actually looked at the pharmaceutical provisions and trade agreements, and he'll be talking to us today about that article. But Tim, if you would like to begin, please. Sure. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Thanks to AM for uh, having me. Delighted to speak. I've been asked to speak about uh, the May 10th agreement and how it came about, as Jonathan mentioned, I was the chief of staff at USDR in the Republican administration when um, when that happened. I think it 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 certainly provides some useful history and context. Uh, you had the Democrats uh, win the Congress in 2006, uh, took over in January 2007. Uh, at the time, there were uh, two free trade agreements that the U.S. had negotiated, Peru and Colombia, that were signed and done. Uh, there were two FTAs with uh, Panama and South Korea that were still under negotiation. On May 10th, uh, and, and there was a deadline at the time for Trade Promotion Authority that these agreements had to be signed uh, by uh, June 30th, the end of June, that uh, in 2007, so there was uh, a, a real deadline that was driving all, all the parties involved. Uh, on May 10th, 2007, an agreement was reached between the Bush administration and uh, both Democrats and Republicans uh, in Congress about how the FTAs would change, uh, in particular in labor environment and, uh, and pharma IP. And um, what we ended up doing was then taking the basis of that agreement and going to each of the FTA partners and essentially renegotiating the agreements on that basis. You know, much of, obviously, the FTA partner countries can read the newspapers and can talk to everybody in D.C., just like everybody always talks to each other in D.C., and they knew uh, the state of play and where things were headed, and so uh, a lot of it wasn't uh, news, and in fact, with the the three developing countries, the renegotiations were uh, well on the easier side. Um, 
what happened procedurally was uh, the two that agreements that were signed and done, uh, Peru and Colombia, were uh, formally amended. Uh, and then Panama and South Korea, uh, it was essentially uh, built in the negotiations and they were signed uh, at the end of June uh, in that year. Um, I will note that on this particular issue, uh, Peru and Colombia and Panama, which is in that particular agreement, what, what these provisions, the changes in farmer IP applied to, um, they happily accepted uh, th those changes. They viewed it as essentially increasing access to medicines in their country and uh, they, they in fact welcomed it. Um, that wasn't true for all the provisions, but, but these particular provisions it, it was. Uh, Peru then, uh, the Peru FTA passed the U.S. Congress uh, that year with overwhelming bipartisan support. I think it included over uh, 100 Democrats supporting it in the House. Um, the other three FTAs eventually did pass the Congress, uh, were brought into force uh, as well. Um, they did have other challenges that were later essentially renegotiated by the Obama administration. But, and in fact, uh, Columbia, the U.S. Columbia agreement, uh, we couldn't reach agreement with the Democrats at the time. We sent it up uh, for consideration under TPA, Trade Promotion Authority rules, which are rules uh, that are enforced today that provide for uh, expedited consideration of the FTA implementing bill in both the House and Senate, and it also provides for uh, uh, not making it amendable. Um, then Speaker Pelosi didn't welcome the move and uh, held a vote to change the rules in the House to essentially uh, unplug the clock on the cl consideration of Columbia FDA. And that sort of uh, ended the issue for the Bush administration. Uh, when the Obama administration eventually renegotiated it, they were able to uh, essentially patch it all together and, and send it back up. So, um, you know, Clearly, I think uh, there's, I think, a lot that can be learned from uh, the dynamics that were in play at that time and, and the, some of the substance of the provisions um, on farm IP, I think, clearly helped gain what ended up being, you know, a massive vote for, in, in both the House and Senate uh, for uh, not only the Peru Agreement, but eventually all of these agreements. So with that, let me turn it over to Laura's next. Well, well, thank you, Tim. And I think that really sets the stage for what we want to talk about, because it gives you that historical precedent of sort of context for why the May 10th agreement was so important. And so when we're looking and reflecting on USMCA, it's really an opportunity to say, let's make sure that Congress can take back that authority and move forward and look at the NAFTA 2.0 and make sure it meets the needs of the entire country. And so there was really, thank you, Tim, for that, for setting that context. Laura, if you can present maybe Network's view of the pharmaceutical Very profession. good, very good. Some of us would call that democracy in action, and uh, we are hoping to see that happen again. So again, my name is Laura peralta Schulte. I am with Network Lobby for Catholic Social Justice. Uh, Network was founded over 40 years ago by Catholic sisters um, to promote policies that benefit those who struggle in poverty. Um, we are open to all who share our passion and some of you in the room might know us a little better by a campaign that we run called The Nuns on the Bus. So um, I'm really here to say today that people of faith across traditions, we work with partners in the Catholic community and our Christian communities and our, and our Jewish communities and our, and our Muslim communities, believe that every life has dignity and that it is sacred. Network grounds our principles in Catholic social justice which holds that access to health care is a human right because it is essential for well-being. Our Catholic sisters and our members reject the notion that only the wealthy should have access to good care. Our most sacred texts urge us to learn to do good, to seek justice, and to help the oppressed. We acknowledge the genius of our scientists who create cures for disease, and we acknowledge the role of the industry uh, that it plays in our healthcare system. Business, said Pope Francis, is a noble calling if performed in the service of the common good. Provisions in the current text, however, are not pro-patient and they do not promote the common good. 
Instead, they prioritize profits over patients. Powerful companies are trying to use complicated trade rules once again to lock in U.S. drug policies and to prevent Congress from taking steps to curb outrageous drug prices. The agreement creates new roadblocks for generic companies to compete with brand name companies after a, p- a patent has expired. It also seeks to export our bad policies to our neighbors. This is simply the wrong step forward. Provisions of the World Trade Organization's TRIPS agreement are currently effect in all NAFTA countries, and this is the standard that should remain. TRIPS calls for respect for intellectual property rights, including for drugs, but also, importantly, recognizes that countries have the right to ensure that medicine is available to all of their residents. We urge you as staff to insist that the administration change the text of the current agreement to get rid of the anti-competitive provisions. And here they go. First, the current text locks in a minimum 10-year marketing exclusivity period for new biologics. That is Article 2049.1. These medicines include new treatments for diseases like cancer, like um, heart disease, like vaccines. The current provision would lock in, as we said earlier, current law for the U.S., but our faith community is also very concerned about how our partners fare, particularly in Mexico, where according to OEC data, seven out of 10 Mexican citizens lives in or near poverty, seven out of 10. Already medicine is out of reach for most people there. And can you imagine what would happen if this goes forward? If unchanged, fewer people will be able to afford medicines. And what is this called? It, it causes preventable preventable suffering and death. Second, the agreement expands what drugs get special biological protections and doubles exclusivity for some medicines. This is Article 2049.2. Congress expressly excluded certain drugs from additional monopoly uh, protections in, in U.S. law, and these provisions and others must be changed to conform with our laws. Third, The agreement extends monopoly protections through evergreen uh, provisions. It requires nations to extend patents through minor changes without any therapeutic benefit to patients, well beyond the original 20-year patent. This is Article 2036.2. And lastly, the agreement requires nations to provide patent term extensions for perceived administrative delays. This is Article 2044. This provision would block competition from the marketplace and again limit Congress's Congress's ability to make change. Listen, no matter what you think about trade policy, we in the faith community believe strongly that it is Congress's right, it is Congress's responsibility to establish U.S. health care law, not trade negotiators and industry lobbyists. We believe that each nation has the right to make sure that their citizens can have uh, life-saving treatments. During his first year, Pope Francis wrote a letter sharply condemning what he called an economy of exclusion. He wrote, just as the commandment, thy shalt not kill, sets a clear limit in order to safeguard the value of human life. Today, we also must say, thou shalt not kill, to an economy of exclusion and inequality. Such an economy kills. Today, high, prices, high drug prices are forcing people to choose whether to take the medicines they need or instead to ration them or simply to go without. This is wrong. Congress and you as staff must insist that we say no to an economy of exclusion and insist again that the administration remove these provisions from this text. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. Uh, I think that was a very important look from the, the avenue of social justice on what does this agreement mean for people's access to health care, both here in the United States as well as in Mexico and Canada. So thank you for that. Our last speaker today is, is Tom Boyke, as I mentioned. And Tom is going to talk about this article that appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine just last week. Um, so Tom, thank you. Great. Uh, Thanks for inviting me. Uh, Let me start with just a few uh, preliminaries. Uh, 
necessary ones. Uh, the council is, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, the Council on Foreign Relations is a independent, nonpartisan membership organization, think tank publisher. It does not take any institutional positions. My remarks here today really are just meant to inform this debate, not advocate for any particular policy outcome. Uh, so please take it, uh, take my comments that are coming uh, with that in mind. Uh, so I've been asked here to speak about this New England Journal of Medicine piece that I uh, co-authored with Aaron Kesselheim at Harvard, looking at what Americans have gotten in return for the expanding pharmaceutical provisions in U.S. trade agreements. Uh, the USMCA is a good opportunity for this because the NAFTA agreement was in fact the first trade agreement to include a intellectual property chapter with pharmaceutical provisions. And in the 25 years subsequent, there have been uh, U.S. trade agreements with 17 uh, other countries, and those pharmaceutical protections, by and large, have expanded uh, over time. So to bring you back to the mid-'80s, where IP was adopted as a U.S. trade um, uh, priority, it was a moment a lot like today. Uh, there were concerns among the public that uh, the U.S. trade deficit was growing and that U.S. manufacturing jobs were declining. So the emphasis on introducing IP as a uh, intellectual property as a, a trade priority was meant to capitalize on U.S. economic advantages and high technology like pharmaceuticals or content like entertainment and movies and music and the like. It was meant to basically introduce a rules-based system and to address what was seen as the time as the risk of theft of, of U.S. property. Over time, in subsequent agreements, those provisions have expanded, as have the policy justifications for them. So more recently, it's been argued uh, that these provisions are a way to address uh, the limited support for R&D in other nations and high U.S. drug prices by changing the incentives that exist uh, around um, uh, pharmaceutical pricing in those nations. And if you have stronger protections here, that means more R&D support abroad, and again, potentially more, uh, more of an avenue to reduce prices here. So, uh, thank you. Um, in this New England Journal of Medicine article, uh, Aaron and I assessed what is the record on delivering on these priorities, and it's been mixed. On one hand, uh, the U.S. pharmaceutical industry is one of our most profitable industries in the country. Uh, it employs hundreds of thousands of people in research, development, and marketing. But uh, the U.S. pharmaceutical trade deficit has ballooned to $52 billion. Uh, in recent years, it's grown at a faster rate than the U.S. trade deficit overall. Uh, that is, particularly in recent years, has been primarily driven by the shifting of manufacturing and the shifting of ownership of patents abroad. Uh, so the largest exporter of pharmaceuticals to the United States is now Ireland with its 12.5% corporate tax rate. So number two, that's the trade deficit. Number two, on manufacturing employment. Uh, U.S. pharmaceutical manufacturing employment, uh, employment, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, hasn't changed substantially since 2001, which was when we had the first uh, post-NAFTA trade agreement. Third, uh, there's not any uh, empirical evidence that despite the fact that many of these agreements are more than a decade old, they do not appear to have raised drug prices in our partner nations to anywhere near the level of U.S. prices. Uh, they certainly have not resulted in Americans paying less for brand name pharmaceuticals. So in terms of looking at the evidence, you know, like Tim, I'm a former trade negotiator. I believe in a rules-based trading system that includes, in, in my view, for pharmaceuticals. Uh, there are good economic and strategic reasons to have this, have a trade agreement with uh, Canada and Mexico. But if Americans and their representatives are looking to the pharmaceutical provisions in the USMCA, which are the most extensive we've had, as a way of addressing current concerns around the U.S. trade deficit, around U.S. manufacturing employment, 
and around high U.S. drug prices, the last 25 years suggest that there isn't any evidence for those hopes. Stop there. Thank you very much, Tom. I think the empirical evidence that you point to is very important as we look to make the strong case on why things need to change and why the USMCA text isn't really in the best interest of America's patients. And actually, we would argue as well, and I think the evidence you highlight points to this, really the best interest of our economy also. One of the, kind of the key principal issue that I think has gotten the most attention, both from members of Congress as well as the press, is related to the 10-year floor for exclusivity for biologics. I'd be interested in each of your perspectives on this issue, but maybe guiding that a, a touch. Tim, one, people have talked about that if this agreement is finalized, that there would be nothing in the agreement or, or no one would care outside of the United States necessarily if they reduce that period below 10 years. Can you address that from your perspective, please? Um, <clears throat> sure. I think, um, first of all, as a general proposition, I think that the U.S. and the U.S. Congress should should uh, endeavor, if they're going to take on an international legal obligation, to do so in good faith and to follow it once you have. Um, and uh, obviously, if if you knowingly take on this uh, obligation of a 10-year minimum, uh, with with the essentially intent to want to violate it, that's that's not necessarily um, an act of good faith. But second, it's just as a practical matter. Um, it would have an impact for those who want to change the law and policy to lower the, the term. It, 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 indisputably, it would make it more difficult because then it wouldn't just be about the underlying um, policy debate, uh, which really is a health care policy debate. Uh, opponents of changing it would be able to say accurately uh, that it would violate a U.S. international legal obligation. Um, and. Uh, as a practical matter, uh, you know, there's a general, I think, assumption right now that um, while in theory that would subject the U U.S. to uh, dispute settlement, a potential loss in dispute settlement, and open the U.S. up to retaliation for that violation, uh, Mexico and Canada don't really like these provisions anyway, so they wouldn't retaliate. But, um, you know, the truth is we don't know exactly in five or ten years what the views of Mexico and Canada will be on these questions. And uh, it could be that... Uh, once they have to change their laws, their views actually do change in the policy, and they, they, and they are upset with the U.S. making that change. It could be that, uh, shockingly, they, you know, what countries tend to do is sometimes bring cynical trade uh, litigation in order to get uh, a chit that they can trade off elsewhere. Um, and sometimes countries do retaliate. So um, I think it's... Uh, uh, I think it's indisputable that it would, it would have an impact on uh, in making it more difficult... Uh, for the U.S. to change uh, uh, its policy going forward, and it does raise certain risks that uh, are, are not, you know, not helpful from any definition from the United States' interests. Thank you, Tim. Laura, can you maybe address this from the faith-based community? Why would they particularly care about this period of exclusivity? Well, I, again, I think it just goes back to what I said earlier. You know, f right now, um, uh, you know, the, we are actually in a very interesting political climate. You know, we have polls that suggest that uh, reducing drug pricing is a major, if not one of the major healthcare concerns in our nation. We had members of uh, Congress, really on both parties, but particularly a number uh, of the new Dems that ran this turn running against uh, high drug pricing and promising constituents to take action. Um, we have the president uh, in the administration that it too is engaged in a discussion about limiting dr drug pricing and trying to find clever ways to address what is a very uh, challenging problem. So, so um, from the perspective of the possible, you know, that is where we are focused. You know, we think we are at a good point in time where um, Congress is starting to listen to folks, and I mean people who are Democrats and Republicans, I'm talking about the common good, folks that cannot afford their medicines, people who can't get their heart disease medicine or their diabetes medicine, who are forced to go to Canada or to Mexico to go get medicines. You know, this is a, this is a real crisis in our country. And so um, to the degree that we have an opportunity to make change, it is really 
I think from the faith perspective, outside the bounds of what is just, to have a negotiate an agreement that was negotiated in private. Uh, largely by corporate lobbyists in, in working with the administration to lock in extra benefits for its industry and then to push them through an undemocratic process, which is the fast track process, um, uh, uh, to the uh, harm of patients. So um, we th really think it is a clever and outrageous trick that is going on here, and we really urge Congress to stop it in its tracks. Thank you. And it's actually now my real pleasure to introduce and invite uh, Chairman Blumenauer to speak to us today. Chairman Blumenauer has proven a sustained voice in promoting a trade policy, a trade regime in the United States that supports U.S. and American businesses, while also balancing that with strong support for the environment, the economy, and an affordable health care system. For more than 20 years, he has represented Oregon's third district, it, uh, advocating for policies that promote human health and human welfare in all assets, aspects of uh, federal policy and federal law. So, and his voice is especially important now as chairman of the Subcommittee on Trade as Congress is debating NAFTA 2.0. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, I'm uh, sorry I got stuck on the floor and unable to be part of your earlier conversation. But uh, I'm pleased that people are coming together to have an opportunity to, to take a broader view of a little challenge we have these days. You may have noticed NAFTA 2.0 uh, is in the, in the wings, waiting for action. Um, and for me, uh, the work that we did uh, with the May 10th ag agreement uh, it's very important because Congress at that point, under Democratic leadership, reasserted control of the process. We uh, were not going to be um, a slave to a timetable that was in a trade promotion authority that actually was uh, passed on a partisan basis, that we didn't have an opportunity to help shape, that didn't fully reflect items that we felt ought to be a part of it. Uh, the House Democratic leadership pulled the plug on it notwithstanding the fast track provisions, that we weren't going to be limited to artificial timelines uh, if we didn't feel that we had an opportunity to have the issues fully vetted and put in standards that would enable us to have greater confidence that the agreements would be worthy of support. Uh, the May 10th agreements uh, established that we were going to have environment, labor, human rights as part of that deliberation and, and frankly uh, uh, had pulled that plug waiting for it to work through. I've been involved with these issues since I first came to Congress. I come from a region that is intensely uh, de trade dependent. We've got little electronic companies like Intel has more employees uh, uh, in our state than any place else in the world. We have little shoe companies like Adidas and Nike, uh, a lot of agriculture input, Boeing. But by the same token, I think I probably represent a larger concentration of trade skeptics than anybody in Congress. Portlandia, uh, uh, folks there had, had some concerns about what had happened with NAFTA. Um, and history has proven that their skepticism was justified. NAFTA, 20 years later, we've seen the environmental sidebars were largely ineffective. You can go down to the river, go down to the border now and look at the new river, uh, Tijuana River. Uh, and they're literally open cesspools. My first question to Ambassador Lighthizer when he came to share with me his concerns about moving forward with NAFTA 2.0, I asked how would NAFTA 2.0 address this? Because NAFTA 1.0 didn't. Um, and we're, this is, I think, one of the areas of concern. When I got involved, it was interesting working with the people who were involved in international trade uh, weren't hung up 
on labor protections, weren't opposed to environmental provisions. In fact, some of the companies in Oregon that were involved overseas uh, actually were uh, implementing American EPA standards for air quality, for instance. Um, labor, environment, um, and human rights uh, should not be a stumbling block. Um, part of what we're looking at now going forward is building on the May 10th uh, provisions. Uh, our committee, the Ways and Means Committee, just issued four letters uh, to Ambassador Lighthizer uh, about concerns that we have uh, with the agreement going forward. Number one, uh, deals with environment. Number two, uh, labor. We've, we've seen that Mexico has uh, acted on their uh, constitutional provisions uh, with legislation, uh, but it looks like it's going to take something like four years to try and renegotiate uh, phony uh, labor agreements that uh, many of the members of the unions under them didn't even know they had. There's some questions about the actual implementation. Uh, I came in and there was some hint in the air about uh, access to medicine. Um, I think that is a legitimate concern. When a lot of what is being claimed as progress under NAFTA 2.0 is not any great accomplishment by the new administration, uh, they largely picked up the framework of the TPP. But the TPP um, is slightly different in terms of what happened with access to medicines. That was an area that I was working on until the last gasp of TPP to try and change it. Uh, we were looking not at the 12 years in, in U.S. law or 10-year exclusivity that uh, was uh, put into um, NAFTA 2.0. We were talking about 8 and 5. Uh, and somehow this was uh, ignored over the objections, I will say, of Canada and Mexico. They didn't, they didn't want this. Uh, it doesn't help them at all. And so we, we have raised that as one of the provisions with Ambassador Lighthizer. Um, uh, in addition to labor, environment, and access to medicines, uh, we have great concerns about how we're going to enforce these agreements. This has been a priority of mine since I first started. In, under the May 10th agreement, we were able to move forward with the Peru Free Trade Agreement, and we were able to incorporate into it provisions I had to stop illegal logging in the Amazon Basin in Peru. It was important to me, uh, and my support for that Free Trade Agreement was predicated on what we were able to achieve, and the Peruvians agreed to it but they didn't honor it. The illegal logging continues in the upper Amazon basin, and I, I frankly, was uh, very disappointed with the Obama administration not moving to enforce areas of clear violation. And I think they would have had uh, a more productive conversation with Congress about the Trans-Pacific Partnership if they had demonstrated more commitment to trade enforcement. Now, I know that it is cumbersome and expensive to enforce trade agreements, but that's no excuse not to try. We shouldn't have to rely on the AFL-CIO to sue to have Guatemala enforce the trade agreement with them. Uh, in the trade promotion authority that we passed, that established, on a, and we passed it on a bipartisan basis, that established the framework to evaluate whether or not a trade agreement was worthy of support. We established a trade enforcement trust fund. The, the uh, trade um, USTR has a relatively modest budget. I think it's $60 million. Uh, these things are complicated. They take time and they're expensive. So we negotiated a trade enforcement trust fund. Um, and sadly, even though I had an agreement with the Republicans um, 
as we were trying to work on this in a bipartisan basis, uh, it really was not fully funded. I find that disappointing. And I've, that's one of the things that I personally uh, am pursuing with this administration and people on both sides of the aisle. If you want to have NAFTA 2.0 go, well, let's, let's revisit our commitment to trade enforcement. And that's one of the provisions we can use to make it more likely. We have uh, the four letters that we've advanced. We will be involved in conversation uh, with the trade uh, uh, ambassador. Um, we think that these are legitimate points where I'm not uh, uh, going to prejudge the outcome, but we're not going to rush this through. We're reaffirming our commitment to those May 10th principles and trying to expand upon them. Uh, we've counseled uh, the administration not to rush the SSA up. There's some groundwork that needs to be done to raise the confidence and the understanding, allow public interaction, uh, because we're all going to be better off if we're able to uh, answer these questions, know more what's involved. That was part of what we did under the TPA, is demand more transparency and people be able to see these. Um, I think we are positioned to have a more productive conversation. But from my vantage point, uh, it's going to be important for us to uh, move forward in both um, environment, labor protections, um, uh, and access to medicine. And last but not least, I think we want to have some understanding of what's going to happen with enforcement. I personally think that Ambassador Lighthizer is committed to it. He's, I've had a number of very productive conversations with him. He's kind of a hawk uh, on that. Uh, it's one of his strong suits. It's one of the reasons why he has rapport with our caucus and our democratic leadership. But trade enforcement should not be contingent on an individual personality. Trade reps come and go. I think since I've been in Congress, there have been seven. Um, and they've had different perspectives. We need to have assurances that the trade agreements that we ultimately negotiate and enact into law are worth the paper they're printed on. And the key is, in, I think a key is enforcement. And that we'll look forward to having that conversation as well. Thanks for letting me kind of elbow my way into your proceedings. Um, I think it's fair to look at what has happened uh, over the course of the last 10 years in terms of dealing with the May 10th, what we've tried to do with a different approach to, uh, to having Trade Promotion Authority. Um, and we're spending a lot of time here on Capitol Hill encouraging our members to do a deeper dive, to ask questions of our trade staff on ways and means. I've had, I don't know, 15 meetings. I mean, we met with the blue dogs and the green dogs and the <laughs> old, old dogs and new dogs. And the, we have a, a wide variety of interest groups in the caucus that have particular concerns. And in fact, we've been having individual meetings with people to try and hear what they're concerned about, raise the comfort level, understand the playing field. This is a, is a different dynamic. Um, almost uh, our very first hearing for the trade subcommittee was with people in organized labor who hadn't really been heard from much in uh, the last eight years on our committee. Uh, I met with a number of international presidents, with President Trumpka of the AFL-CIO, trying to make sure we understood what their concerns are and that they understand that they are being listened to and that they are a part of this process. Um, we're not going to be uh, well served by trying to rush this through before it's ready. I'm absolutely convinced that Speaker Pelosi, who demonstrated in the past that it didn't seem right to her and to her caucus, pulled the plug. I don't think this is going to be rushed through until we have a chance to thoroughly examine these things, raise the comfort level, and have more people uh, involved with trying to fine fine tune this. And things like the Mexican labor agreement and enforcement are going to be things that uh, really are, I think, sort of bottom line concerns. Uh, I'm done. 
I will let you continue with uh, the panel. I'm going to get out of town uh, <laughs> and go back and uh, do a healthcare forum in Oregon. But uh, really welcome your interest and concern. Um, because this is something that, as near as I can tell, nobody wants to blow up. Nobody wants to withdraw from NAFTA, with the possible exception of a tweet out of the White House every now and then. Nobody thinks that the original NAFTA is something that they feel comfortable with. The, the problems have been acknowledged, and there have been efforts to try and change it. Um, but where we, where we go from here, um, in terms of trying to have additional refinement and comfort, I think is very important. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, Chairman Blumenauer. Thank you for your leadership on this issue. It's very important, and uh, we feel, I think America feels comfortable with, with the discuss discussions you're having in the subcommittees. Thank you. Um, I'd like to now open the floor up to questions that we may have from the audience for our panel. Please. Thank you. Um, my name is Brian Riley. I'm the International Taxpayers Union. And you know, most economists, liberal, conservatives, can talk about tariffs are bad, they're aggressive. Um, it's more challenging for me looking at things like the Taiwan should have left property and this, that, and the other thing. So this panel has been extremely helpful. And I appreciate it. Appreciate the invitation to be here. I just want to ask, just to clarify, I think I understand what your tools are. But just keep it really simple for me. Um, for those of you that can, can advocate on a particular position, is that Congress should not move forward with doing USMCA until these provisions are renegotiated out of the tax, or is there some other um, source uh, or, or process to get that to happen? Am I understanding what the answer to this is? What you know, um, from the Association for Accessible Medicine's perspective, we believe that there are key provisions within the agreement that could be reformed to ensure that patients have access to the competitive biologic and generic marketplace that has helped lower prices for patients across the United States. And we believe setting the parameters so that can continue in Canada, Mexico, in the, and the United States is very important. Some of that can be done through uh, sort of a, a, a careful review of the legislation and looking for ways to actually improve that to reflect the need to have that competitive environment that allows generic and biosimilars to come to the marketplace at a period of uh, without extended exclusivities that currently exist in the current framework. I don't know. If, Laura, do you want to? Yeah, I, I would just... We're with you. Uh, we're praying for you. Uh, and um, I would just say, I think the way that you stated it uh, up front is very well. You know, we think, and that's why I was painstakingly going through the details of the, the specific provisions. Those are the provisions we believe need to come out, uh, should be renegotiated. Um, and then I think you would see, as the chairman said, uh, you know, good support. You make these changes as, as long as well as those with labor and environment. And I think that is where the Democratic Caucus is. We met with so many offices, uh, and I think that is how we get a good package to move forward in a bipartisan manner. Yes. Please. Yes. Sure. Um, Isabel Hoagland with Inside U.S. Trade. Um, I'm just wondering how these conversations have progressed with USTR because USTR has maintained that the USMCA language will not raise drug prices. They released a specific statement. Um, and it also sounds like there's opposition from Mexican and Canadian officials and, and specifically in the government not to reopen. Um, though Congressman Blumenauer earlier this week said we'll see what happens and that he had conversations with the Mexicans and Canadians and it made it seem like they may be open. Um, so I'm just wondering if you can convey a status update on how USTR has been engaging with you and, and whether you think they're open to making these changes you're calling for. 
Yeah, I, um, AAM did uh, engage with USDR during the negotiations, um, and and in fact uh, has someone on the the uh, trade advisory committees as well. Um, uh, but truth be told, I mean, you know, you can read the newspapers. This is really a discussion between uh, the House uh, and Senate and and the administration, and and uh, uh, I think AAM's views are are laid out clearly in some of the materials here. But it's it's um, uh, really a discussion, but within the government right now. Hey, we've been talking to the. I mean, the U.S. government is very well aware of our positions, as Tim mentioned. It's clearly dis described in all of our communication we've had. Uh, we've sent letters to USDR. We've had conversations. But it is right now at this political discussion between uh, members of Congress and, and USDR. We are very aligned with our Canadian and Mexican counterparts. Um, our leadership from each association has actually uh, sent a joint letter. We um, have, I think, all of our concerns that we have, they share. They want to make sure, and they're advocating with their government that these issues need to be opened up because it's in the best interest of the Mexican patient, the best interest of the Canadian patient, and we believe the best interest of the American patient. So I think there's a unified industry looking at it from each of the three countries. And in conversations that they're having, I think they're, they're finding receptive audience in both governments, in, in the Mexican and Canadian governments as well. If I can only add, I think the U.S. Trade Rep is a very smart person and understands the politics. And so, you know, again, that is why the hope is there that they will make changes. Now, this is a dance, and and Tim, you could probably speak to this uh, uh, with greater legitimacy uh, than I because you were at U.S. Terra at the time. You know, in these negotiations, it is often the case that foreign governments will say nothing is going to change. I'm thinking of the Korea uh, uh, um situation where literally the day before the the text was changed, the Korean government uh, leader was on the front page saying, no can do. Um, we do know that I, the IP ask is a U.S. ask. Um, we do know that uh, particularly in Mexico, you have a government that ran a campaign on lifting up the common good. So I, I do not think this is one of the issues that, as was said earlier, would cause any consternation and, in fact, would be very welcomed, and that, and that is what should happen. Yes, please. There's been a number of public comments by the ambassador um, expressing a willingness to try to fix this outside of the text itself. As a strict legal matter, does that fix anything? From, well, Tim, I, from our perspective, then, Tim, I'll let you. There are certain things that could be fixed outside of the text, but some of the key components of the, the issues that impact exclusivity for biologics, for example, the text would need to be changed to be modified. There, there may be other ways to do this, and we don't want to presuppose what the Canadian, Mexican, and government, some innovative, unique solutions to address that. Um, but what is clear is that it needs to be specifically focused on, and there needs to be some official agreement between the governments to change that aspect of the text. I don't know, Tim, if you want to... Yes, please. And can you come up for the microphone? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm Stacy Thompson <coughs> with Congresswoman Houlihan's office. Can you respond to industry's claim that the changes that you've suggested to the exclusivity provisions would hamper innovation and private investment in the United States? Tom, do you have a thought on that, or happy to answer? Um, in terms of the, just to be clear, the changes that have been advocated for by, by the association? Not specifically, but broader changes to the So if anything changes, it would hamper the innovation environment? Yes. Okay. Um, so uh, in terms of the, the provision, this gets back to the questions we had before about whether this, this locks in um, the United States. United States law is United States law. 
So if the argument is that you need to have this provision so you can't change U.S. law, well, then that gets at Tim's concern that you're backing into domestic policy by having this provision. If the argument is that what this agreement says doesn't restrict U.S. law, the way to deal with adequate support for innovation domestically is through U.S. law and policy. That's not something that's meant to be set in a trade agreement. Um, in terms of how it affects the support in other countries, this gets to the issue we referenced before about whether or not these provisions have increased prices in other countries. And there's not a lot of empirical evidence and some pretty strong evidence that, at least not yet, um, what they certainly haven't done is increased it to anywhere approaching U.S. prices. So uh, the last thing I would say is that, uh, again, if we want to support R&D, there are really direct ways we can do that domestically. Doing that through market exclusivity or intellectual property in another country, of course, there are other nations with high market exclusivities and intellectual property, like many European nations, that pay substantially less for their drugs than we do. So there are still other policies the government can implement to uh, undermine the objective <coughs> of trying to have this result in, in more revenues. So again, if our concern is about innovation, I think there are some pretty uh, uh, ways to be uh, to pursue that domestically. Oh, uh, time for one more question. Going, going. Well, well. Thank you, everyone. Panel, Tom, Laura, Tim. Thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate your time. <laughs>